has demonstrated strength, resilience, tenacity, and determination in service of the principles that animate the American experiment. She stood firm, resolute, collecting the facts and telling the story of recent American history, even when it brought death threats and electoral defeat. Reading her book, an inside account of her experiences during and after January 6th, one cannot help but appreciate her hard work, her keen intellect, her unflinching dedication to uncovering the truth, her impatience with political posturing, and her enduring respect for colleagues, staff, and peers, Republicans and Democrats who prioritize country over self. Sort of a, a tectonic shift and um, and that's happening for a number of reasons I think certainly what's happening in the Republican Party is very dangerous and I think that um, you know we we now have one of our two major political parties that that has abandoned the Constitution and I I don't say that lightly and and I, I don't I say that with real sadness um, but but because that's happening, I think that, um, I, I hope that, that it will, um, one of the outcomes of this period, after we defeat Donald Trump in November, will be, will be that, that we really do look at how we conduct politics and, and that we all, we all have a responsibility to incentivize our public officials to engage in substantive debate, to be respectful, um, and, and I hope we will walk back from sort of this, the edge of the abyss that we're looking into um, that, that has become so divisive and partisan and so toxic in so many ways. Um, so speaking of uh, Donald Trump, which you do speak of a lot. Uh, I, I have some views. <laughs> yes, I do. Um, so it wasn't really close, you know, in, in most of those primaries or any of those primaries, right? Um, were you uh, surprised um, just how quickly he marched through those various states? And you know, what do you attribute that to? That cult of personality you talk about, or do you think there were other factors at work that just caused such dominance through these primaries so far? Fear. Well, I would say a couple of things. First of all, I think that if you look at the results um, uh, in in a number of these early primaries, what what we saw was um, in some instances close to 30 percent of the Republicans say they won't vote for Donald Trump. And so, although he won, that's a that, that is not a basis on which someone should go into a general election feeling any comfort about being able to prevail in the general. And um, so, you know, I think that as soon as uh, the Republicans um, at the, you know, after the January 6th attacks, there were a couple of weeks where we were really unified. and. Um, uh, everybody seemed to understand and recognize the need to to reject what had happened, to reject Donald Trump, and to move forward. But as soon as uh, you know Kevin McCarthy went to Mar-a-Lago, sort of welcomed Trump back into the fold, began to help rehabilitate him. I, I think that you know um, you really did begin to see uh, the development of sort of the Republican Party. Um, beginning to embrace him again, and there were a whole range of reasons why that happened. I think you had you had some elected Republicans who believed that he would just disappear, who thought, you know, we don't have to actually speak against what he did, we don't have to actually stand up to him, because you know certainly he will fade away, um, and and obviously that didn't happen. And and I think when people look back at this time, at at the history of this time. Those elected officials who know the danger that he poses, who know that what he's saying is a lie, who knows, who know that he threatens fundamentally our democratic system, but yet have enabled him and have gone along, you know, they will be judged very harshly by history because the, he can't succeed without them. And 
uh, and the role that they're playing is is, uh, is a very irresponsible and reckless and dangerous one. Freezer. So, so do you feel that if uh, those Republicans uh, that began to, I guess, wash over what happened on January 6th, that that would have opened the way for some of the other contenders in the primary, and Nikki Haley, whoever? Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, I think that what we saw happen uh, was um, sort of this notion uh, that Republican elected officials um, excused the behavior, um, enabled the behavior, uh, and, and by doing that, it sort of it created a situation where um, I think voters thought, well, you know, it, it must not be that he's that dangerous because if he were, then you know you would have more people saying so. And um, and I, look, I think the Republican Party leadership itself um, had to make a choice. Uh, many times they were faced with a choice between. Uh, you know, doing what was right between furthering the democracy and, and, and the Constitution or embracing Donald Trump, and, and they chose Donald Trump. And, and it's, that, that is a situation we, haven't, we have not seen before in the history of the country. Um, you think voters are, um, have reached a place of, I'm just over this, I just don't want to hear about Donald Trump, I don't want to hear about January 6th, I don't... I just, I'm, I'm so tired of it. Watch the, com or maybe they didn't watch the commission hearings, but, um, uh, versus. <laughs> you didn't need that, it's okay. <laughs> That's my punishment for not giving you my notebook earlier. <laughs> uh, versus um, still being engaged in the issue at hand. Look, I think, um, you know, in every presidential election year, uh, you know, people, um, are not intensely engaged. I mean, obviously, here in Iowa, people are, um, you know, particularly in the run-up to the caucuses. Um, but, but then, you know, you sort of get into the spring across the country and the summer, and people, people aren't intensely engaged in it generally. And I think what we normally see is sort of once you get to the fall of a presidential election year. Um, people begin to refocus uh, and, and, uh, and pay attention. And I, I think there's no question um, but that the numbers that we talked about earlier, when you see that many Republican voters expressing, you know, uh, an objection to voting to Donald Trump, uh, to voting for Donald Trump, uh, you know, that tells you that people uh, have taken his measure. and. Um, and, and I'm certainly going to do everything that I can to make sure that people recognize, especially in swing states, um, the, the danger that he poses and, and why investing him again with the power of the presidency um, would, be, would be an existential threat to, uh, to the survival of the republic. So do you see... see yourself actually out campaigning or more of an educational role? What role does Liz Cheney play in all this? Yeah, I mean, I, uh, I'll i be doing both things. I will um, be, be uh, helping people understand and recognize and reminding people about, about what he did. Um, also reminding people about sort of the specific steps we know that he will take. I mean, it, it's, it's important um, to, to recognize, for example, uh, what it would mean to have a president who refused to abide by the rulings of our courts. And um, when, you know, you have a situation where uh, the reason that our courts have the power that they do and that they have to have under our Constitution is because the chief executive enforces their rulings. The courts can't enforce their own rulings. and and. All you have to do is listen to what Donald Trump says, look at the filings that, um, that his lawyers have made in the immunity case and others. Um, he, you know, the, the moment that the court rules in a way he disagrees with, he will just ignore it. He'll refuse to abide by it. And, and that, that's, 
the quickest way that you can begin to have the kind of unraveling that's so dangerous. The other thing that I think it's important for people to remember is the kinds of people that he will appoint. Um, one of the things that we learned in the select committee was how often it was good and responsible people, good and responsible Republican officials at the state level, also around Donald Trump, who, who stood up to him and who said no, and, and who said, you know, who told him again and again, what you're saying about these elections, what you're saying about fraud, what you're saying about the election having been rigged, it's not true. They told him repeatedly and with specificity. Those kinds of people won't be around him again in a second term. And I, I think that's also important for people to understand. Um, you know, he, he will appoint people who will do his bidding. He will appoint people, um, and if they are nervous about doing his bidding, he'll offer them pardons. Um, and and he, won't, he won't leave office. I mean, just think about, we know he tried once not to leave office. Um, and, and he will have no incentive to guarantee a peaceful transfer of power and to leave office if he's elected again. So I, I do think it's very important for people, as frustrated as I know people get sometimes with um, you know, policy disagreements you might have, um, and I certainly have policy disagreements with the Biden administration, I know the nation can survive bad policy. We can't survive a president who is willing to torch the Constitution. I think it'd be safe to say that your actions after January 6th had a few consequences for your political career, right? Um, when you think back on, um, when you think back on what you did and how you did it in the kind of strong language you've used and continue to use, um, do you have any um, regrets about the way you approached it or anything you would do differently if you had to do it again? Well, I would not support Donald Trump, <laughs> president. Um, but I, uh, do what we want. I, I, you know, I, I don't have any, any regrets um, about sort of the decisions that I made after January 6th. And, and to me, it, it never seemed as though um, there was really a choice in the matter. Um, you know, uh, as, as the attack was happening on January 6th, you know, we had watched in the immediate aftermath of the election, um, you know, I thought, all right, and I think a lot of Republicans thought, he has the right to bring challenges in court if there's a basis for it, um, but soon the election will be called and then you know, Donald Trump will concede and, and the country will move on. Um, but it became clear as we got into later November, December, of course, that that's not what he was doing. And, um, and, and I, I, I was very surprised. Um, you know, I obviously grew up in a family, was very involved in politics. Um, I believed that elected officials, um, for the most part, uh, were good and honorable people and, and would do their duty. And so I was surprised at um, uh, sort of the, the plague of cowardice that kind of swept through uh, the Republicans. And um, so, it, you know, I, I, um, uh, I think that we were confronted with a series of uh, decisions that had to be made that were very clear. It was, there was no question that he, he uh, committed high crimes and misdemeanors, both because of you know, what he had done in the run-up to January 6th and, and uh, his failure for three, three hours. I mean, just the, think about those 187 minutes. Um, while the Capitol was being attacked and Donald Trump sat in the dining room next to the Oval Office and he watched the attack happen. He watched it play out on television and his advisors were coming in and telling him, you have to tell the mob to stop and he wouldn't tell them to stop. And his daughter was telling him that. And then at one point we know from testimony in the select committee that he was handed a note, and the note said a civilian had been shot 
at the chamber, at the door to the chamber of the House of Representatives. And still, you know, he, he put the note down on the table in front of him and would not tell the mob to stop. And, and so, you know, the, there was enough that we knew at the time of the impeachment vote in terms of uh, his lack of action, his, his mobilization of the mob, his incitement of the mob, that it was clear he had to be impeached. Of course, the select committee work led to a much greater understanding of the evidence and, and the, the depth and the extent of the plan. Um, but he should have been convicted. If the Senate had moved and had held the trial immediately, um, he would have been convicted, uh, and, and we wouldn't be dealing with the challenge that we're facing. I think we go from here. Do you see um, Republicans um, uh, pushing the Democratic Party more to the center in some cases, or a third party, or bringing the GOP back? Oh, where do you think the party goes? Yeah, I mean, look, I um, I think that fundamentally, the the vast majority of American voters um, want uh, leaders who are responsible, leaders who are serious, leaders who are mature, um, leaders who you know you can count. I mean, I know that's like a low bar, but <laughs> I have to say it. These days. <laughs> Uh, but but I mean if you if you think about sort of what what unites us as Americans and what is so so magnificent and special about our country about the fact that we get to choose our leaders the fact that we we get to decide what laws we live under I mean though, though that is a, a miraculous blessing and and I think most Americans want leaders, and especially want a president who, who won't just remind us that, you know, we are a great country, but who will remind us that we are a good country, and and that goodness and compassion, um, and um, and and a reverence for our constitution and and for the blessings of this nation. That those are things that I think bind us and unite us beyond party. And I think that when we come through this period and as we think about sort of what happens after 2024, um, it's, it's gonna be necessary for all of us to decide we're not just gonna be bystanders. And, and we're, you know, I can, I can talk about what I think I need to do, but, but it's actually, I think, much more important to talk about what we all have to do. Because what we've seen, What we have, what we've seen is, uh, you know, evidence that that there's there's not there's nobody else coming here. You know, this is us. It's up to us. And this is, you know, this is a moment when all of us have been entrusted with making sure we defend this country and we defend our system so we can hand it to our kids. And 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 that is that means we've got to get involved. We've got to get engaged. Um, and I, uh, one of the questions the students asked me earlier, which I hear a lot, is, you know, for politics is so messy these days, and and it is. And I, I fully understand people who sort of say, look, you know, why would I want to get in the middle of that mess? But the problem is, you know, right now the people that are in the middle of the mess are making the mess worse. And so we, we really, we need people to run for office, people to be engaged, to support good candidates, and, and that's never gonna be more important than, um, you know, once we get through this election cycle. So we don't wanna end this with everybody depressed, right? That would be <laughs> <laughs> I like to spread sunshine. Everywhere I, go. I know, that's the same as me. That's my thing. You know, that's what I'm known for. So uh, here we are, of the two sunshine ladies. <laughs> that's right. Oh, that's right. We'll try to end this on a little better note. When, when you look ahead, you obviously believe in everything enough to be out. You didn't just run to Wyoming or somewhere and hide, right? You're out there fighting. Um, can you just leave us with some thoughts about, um, you know, what gives you hope at this? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I go back to, um, 
if, if you if you just stop for a moment and you think about um, you know what what does it mean to be an American and um, and you think about the sacrifices that people have made um, throughout our history. I mean, I, I happened to be in New York uh, a couple of weeks ago, and um, one of my daughters was with me, and we, I'd never done this before, we visited um, St. Paul's Chapel, uh, which is actually right, it's, it was in the shadow of where the World Trade Towers used to stand, and it's, um, it's a church that George Washington worshiped in, and he worshiped there right after he was uh, sworn in. Um, and then we, we went and visited Federal Hall where George Washington um, took the oath of office uh, as our first president. And, and it's such a moving thing to, to visit those places, to read the oath that he took, and to think about the miracle of this country and the miracle that's been sustained um, you know, for nearly 250 years now. And, and how, what a blessing it is for all of us that we're the beneficiaries of those sacrifices. And, and what a blessing it is for all of us that, that, you know, we have the responsibility now to perpetuate it. And, and I, I'm just given tremendous inspiration by the people that I meet around the country, by the people who, you know, fundamentally, I think if you asked any group of Americans, without exception, you know, do you want your kids to live in a country characterized by the peaceful transfer of power? I don't care if you're a Republican or a Democrat, that's what we want. And, um, and I, I think that if, if we're willing to say, listen, we're in a moment of crisis in many ways and we have to set aside uh, our partisan differences and do everything that we can to make sure we do perpetuate that, make sure our kids do grow up in that country. Um, I don't have any, any doubt that we'll succeed. And, and then um, we can get back to the days of disagreeing about tax policy or whatever <laughs> it is, but, but let's make sure that we commit ourselves to working together to save the foundation of the republic so we can keep having those debates about the direction of the country.